Okay, the pot has boiled over at this point. We are 100%, like I said, on, um, you know, Operation Meg and Harry Freedom at this point. And they are, I mean, they couldn't be more unhappy with the press that they are receiving. So what do they do? Well, what would you do? Call your best friend Elton John and tell him all your problems. So they call Elton John and, and Elton's husband, David, and they confess. We need help. Um, we're sort of losing it over here, guys. And Elton says, come to us. You guys, how bad can your life be when, when you're feeling a little bit put upon and you need a vacation that, that you can just call Elton John and be like, you guys get room for us in the south of France? Like, I'm sorry, your life is not that bad if you've got him on speed dial and his home as your home at the drop of a hat. So anyway, they scuttle off down to France, summer 2019. I mean, what a traumatic and degrading life they do lead. You know, they're like, they invited us to come to the house. So we did. I mean, as if they would have ever, as if Megan would have ever been like, oh, go hang out with a celebrity. No, I've got other things to do. I got bigger fish to fry. I mean, that girl couldn't pack her bags fast enough as if they wouldn't have, have said yes to it. Um, so he writes that for a few days, they sat out on the terrace and just soaked in all that sun. And listen to this line. Freedom of any kind in any measure had come to feel like a scandalous luxury. To be out of the fishbowl for even an afternoon felt like a release from prison. I mean, that is sickening. sick -ening. What are you talking about? Freedom of any kind. Come to feel like a scandalous luxury. I'm scandalized that, you're, that you think that, they, that, that, that you haven't had, like, the best life of all time. He said one afternoon they took a scooter ride with David around the local bay. Listen to this. Meg was on the back and she threw out her arms and shouted for joy as we zoomed through the little towns. Smelt people's dinners from open windows and waved to children playing in their gardens. I mean, is her life like a low budget TV romance, straight to DVD, Walmart $5 bin movie? Like what is this lifestyle? On the back of a scooter, zooming through some, you know, little European town? I'm sorry, is this a 2004 teeny bopper film? I, I feel like I'm gonna run into Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen at any moment right now. Okay, um, surprisingly, no one bothered them. They didn't know us. How is it that these people in France didn't know who you were, yet the people on Botswana and Air knew Meg so immediately and so profoundly that they wanted not only her autograph, but also a picture with her, and th that was back when she was just on Suits. Yet these people in France have never heard of you? You, Prince Harry? Um, the best part of the visit, he says, was watching Elton and David and their two boys fall in love with Harry's son, Archie. He says that Elton kept studying Archie's face and Harry knew what it was. He was seeing mummy. He was seeing mummy's face and Archie's. Well, probably was studying the kid's face to be like, you know, is this their kid or did they adopt this child? Anyway, um... He says that the truth is he couldn't blame Elton because time and again, he'd seen the ex an expression cross Archie's face and it would bring him up short. Mommy. And you know, all I can really say to that is this. That therapist should have won awards <laughs> hitherto unknown. Like she, she is the greatest therapist of all time. If she can take after a couple of sessions with, with Harry, take him from the brink of forgetting completely his mother's face to now being able to see his mother's face in the doughy soft flesh of an infant male. Someone help me here, okay? You couldn't remember your mother's face, but suddenly you're, 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 you're spotting expressions on your child's face, this, this couple of month old child, okay. But he says, you know, of course, he, he can't revel in the love of his child because every time he hugs his kid, it's tinged with, tinged with nostalgia, tinged with pain and grief. Now, look, here's the thing. As I've mentioned many times, my mother passed before I had kids. And I am not so cold and heartless that I can't admit that 
you know, I think part of the greatest grief I felt since losing my mother is having had my kids, not getting to see her interact with them, not getting to ask her, you know, like, how do I be a good mom? Like, what do I, what do I do in these situations? You know, it's like a new, it was like a new grief with each child. However, it wasn't something I dwelt on daily where I couldn't even hug my kids because it would make me think I'm so sad because my mom's passed away. It'd just be a thought that would come up like birthdays or, I mean, especially when I was like a really young mother and like, I didn't even know that nursing could like be hard. I thought it was just something your body just did. I mean, I just remember there's so many little milestones and, and things I wanted to share and things I wanted to ask that I couldn't. So I'm not saying that I don't totally see what he's saying. Watching your children grow and not getting to share it with a parent who's passed, there there is like layers of grief there. But as you grow as a human being, that grief doesn't go away, but you become bigger than the grief, right? So like when you have a hard thing happen, that that pain is like all consuming for a little while. If you stay the same person that you were when it happened, that grief will always consume you. If you continue to grow as a person, that grief never goes away. The tragedy is always the same size, but now you can hold it. You know what I'm saying? But I think the thing that's so difficult for Harry is he always stayed that same size. So the grief was, it, it never, it, it, it always was going to consume him. Anyway. Um, all right. So he is talking about how being a parent is just, you know, ball of tragedy. It's so terrible. Anyway, um, he gets finally around to talking about the end of the holiday. They're all just sitting around drinking, really Kardashian it up. And there they are laying around, scrolling their phones, drinking their drinks, shaking their salads. And then they start talking about what, how, what a sorry state the press is in. You're going to tell me this is the first time you decided to bring this up, please. Um, and I just want to say this too. This whole time that he's been talking about Elton John, he's been very complimentary. I mean, how could you not be? The man just invited you to his home for vacation. Um, but in typical Harry fashion, compliment, 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 punch. And he says that they had, they got into what a sorry state the press was. And really that just meant that Britain was going downhill. Cause of course, you know, this is the end of democracy. Then they started talking about books. I guess Harry probably exited the conversation at that point. Although he does enter it in to start criticizing Elton. David mentions that Elton's long awaited memoir is finally coming out. It's finally done. He's toiled over it low these many years. And Elton is mighty proud of it. Who wouldn't be? I mean, writing a memoir has to be probably one of the hardest things to do. If you're going to write it honestly, if you're going to write it truthfully, if you're going to see yourself or who you were in all the situations you're writing about. Well, he's really proud of it. Bravo, Elton, says Harry. But then Elton mentioned that it was going to be serialized. Is that so? Where? Yes, the Daily Mail. He saw my face. He looked away quickly. He doesn't need your approval. He's Elton John. Like, he doesn't need little old Harry to, you know, tell him it's okay for him to choose to serialize his book in the Daily Mail. Elton, how in the absolute, I want people to read it, but Elton, the very people who've made your life miserable. Exactly. Who better to excerpt it? What better than the very newspaper that's been so poisonous to me my whole life? Who better? I just, I just don't understand. I mean, it's called money, Harry. <laughs> you should be very familiar with the stuff. So he says it was a warm night, but the topic, I mean, so he was already sweating. But now the beads were dripping off of his face. So indignant was he to find that his friend was working hand in hand with the Daily Mail and making a couple of bucks off of these people who had victimized him, supposedly. I mean, wouldn't that be like the ultimate payback if the very people who had bothered you were now having to pay you? Seems like I would be okay with that. Anyway, he's over there just sweating bullets, angry, angry, angry. He says that the thing he couldn't understand is he had sued, uh, or Elton John had sued the Daily Mail 
uh, over a decade earlier because the Daily Mail had told some story that said that Elton John was an unfriendly person and that if you were a fan, don't bother to go to him because he's going to ignore you. And so ultimately, they'd written him a check for a hundred thousand pounds. Okay, so they they've that you know they've already paid their dues. Um, and now they're working with him and they're going to print his stuff. So it's like at a certain point, what are you going to harbor bad feelings all the time? You call them out. They paid you off. Now you have a working relationship. You're going to continue to get paid. Like, it's like, hmm, huh, increase my bank account or continue to nurse my grudges. Continue to lick my wounds and be sorry for myself and not move on as a person. Or, oh, thank you. Another check. Thank you. Don't mind if I do. You know, it's like if everything's already been cleared up, you've already made your point. Like, what can Carrie not understand about this? Like, what is different about Elton John working with the Daily Mail and Harry working with Netflix, who has uh, that the drama The Crown out, which is factual on some things and very non-factual about other things. And, you know, I, a lot of us enjoyed watching it. I loved watching The Crown. But there's all manner of documentaries on there about the royal family. What is so different about Harry having a working relationship with Netflix, but Elton John's not allowed to have a working relationship with the Daily Mail? I don't understand this hypocrisy. Okay, so um, he says that Harry had tried to bring Elton John to see the light. He tried to steer him away from this business deal that he had already agreed to do. He says that he reminded him that he'd stirringly said in one interview, they can call me a fat old C word. They can say I'm an untalented bastard. They can call me a poop, but they mustn't lie about me. That's what Elton John had supposedly said, which I mean, what kind of, I, Harry says that that was like the most inspirational thing he'd ever heard. But I think that that's odd because what, like, what are you ultimately saying? All those things are true about me, but don't lie about me. Like, what are you? A fat old C word, an untalented bastard, a poop? Like, those are okay to say, but don't, I don't know. That's So after they get done spoiling their holiday with Elton John, um, as they spew some more of their self-righteous tomfoolery, he says that it was time for them to go to South Africa. Oh, South Africa. The place where we really start to find out how how much they loathe everyone and everything and how what a fantasy world they're living in.